Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm Rob Kant. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Alligator People, and Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bee is my two favorite books. Uh, and they are both available now. You can get Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees as a uh, paperback, obviously, an audiobook, and the ebook is free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. These are middle grade adventures about an 11 year old biracial boy detective uh, and um, giant robot beans and alligator people. It's a good time. Uh, it's um, uh, Archimedes, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, it's basically it's 11 year old Batman uh, is the pitch for this one. Uh, so check out Banneker Bones. If you're going to the library and you were watching or listening to this show, so I assume you've got a library card. The next time you're there, stop the library and say, do you have a copy of Banneker Bones and the giant robot bees on your shelves? If they do, great, check it out. You only have to download the ebook. Uh, if they don't, ask them to go ahead and order it. That way you can read it and maybe hopefully some Somebody else will be able to read it as well. The show is free. If you've been listening to it, you're getting a lot of inf information out of it. And you're wondering, what can I do to help that fine Rob Kent fellow out? Ask your librarian to get a copy of Banneker Bones of the Giant Robot Beans. Download your free copy. If you like it, leave a review. Um, I was able to, uh, I request books from my library online. You don't even have to go there in person. Uh, so check out Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees under the super secret pen name Robert Kent. I've written adult novels, including the Book of David, uh, which is a very, very adult novel. This is uh, uh, Stephen King, uh, Light. Uh, lots of profanity, lots of offensiveness. In fact, it's uh, five volumes long and it graduates in offensiveness with each volume. So if you just want to dip your toe in, you can get chapter one of the Book of David uh, as an ebook. It's free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. While you're at the library, request these as well. Uh, if you like chapter one, come see me for chapter two through chapter five with money. If you don't even want to wait that long, you can get the whole five uh, volume. Uh, horror serial novel as a compendium. Just go over the Book of David by Robert Kent. Uh, and finally, I was thinking about this a lot uh, today. Uh, All Together Now, A Zombie Story, which is a young adult horror novel. This one, there's no profanity, but don't let that fool you. There is a lot of violence and a lot of offensive content. I just don't swear while doing so, so I'm hopefully able to get away with it a little bit better. I was uh, thinking, because it's uh, I wrote this and I published it just as my wife was heavily pregnant with our son, and he's five now. Uh, so I was looking back at it, uh, and I... I hadn't thought about it for a while. I've been busy doing other things. And I read a part of it earlier today because I was uh, trying to avoid writing my new book, uh, which the easiest way to do that is go read part of the old one. And it still holds up. I really, I love zombies. You love zombies. You're going to be creeped out. This one is short and sweet. The chapters go by a couple of pages at a time. Everyone ends with a cliffhanger ending. And it's all about characters. Everybody's got zombies. I've got characters. If you're wondering about what an interracial romance looks like in Indiana, small Indiana town during the zombie apocalypse with a church of religious crazies who are just going nuts with the dead returning all together now a zombie story that's the one you're going to love if you like that check out all right now a short zombie story uh, as always you can find out more about me and what's going on with the podcast at middlegradeninja.com uh, head there you can read interviews with hundreds of different literary agents authors other publishing professionals got guest posts by the same once in a while i write something that's somewhat insightful you can check that out as well uh, and then coming up here on the podcast on Friday, make sure you come back. We're going to have uh, New York Times bestselling author Amber Smith. Uh, she will be here Friday. We're going to be discussing her new novel, Something Like Gravity, uh, which is an amazing book. Uh, I loved it. I can't wait to talk with Amber about it. Uh, and then next week, we're going to be chatting with um, author Marie Miranda Cruz. Uh, and then we've got uh, some more editors and literary agents lined up after that. It's going to be nonstop awesomeness here at Middle Grade Ninja. Today, we are uh, absolutely beside ourselves with joy. We're going to be talking with former editor, editor and current literary agent Molly O'Neill. Uh, Molly, how are you tonight? Hello, uh, middle grade ninjas and friends. <laughs> and I'm good. 
Molly, it's uh, so thank you so much for uh, for clearing the time out of your schedule to be here and to talk with us tonight. Uh, I am terrible about summarizing other authors' books, and I'm terrible at summarizing people's biographies. So if we could just start, if you would tell um, the esteemed audience a little bit about yourself and your background in publishing. Yes. Um, I realize the longer I'm in publishing, the longer this story gets. So I'm going to try and keep it condensed. Um, I grew up in Texas. I went away to college um, in the Midwest when I was 18. My goals for college were to get far away from my family, sorry, mom and dad, uh, and see snow. Uh, and so I ended up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at Marquette University. Um, I was a creative writing major and an elementary education major. And the two sort of merged midway. And I had the epitome of a really good liberal arts education because I had professors who recognized that I had this growing interest in children's books. Um, this was some years ago. Uh, I graduated college in 2000, so it's it's been a minute. Um, so publishing children's books weren't quite as well known um, and as visible as, as they are today as an industry, but I had professors who recognized that I had this this interest and they encouraged the curiosity. They didn't necessarily know how to help connect me to publishing because it's a long way from Milwaukee to New York City, um, but they encouraged the curiosity and I kind of found my, my own way. Um, I did some internships. I had a professor who was a great mentor um, and eventually I ended up in New York City, um, which is where a young person goes when they want to work in publishing. Um, and how and old were you coming uh, from the Midwest when you, when you arrived in New York? So I took two years between graduating college and um, moving to New York. I went to a very activist college. Everybody went off to save the world for a couple of years. Um, and so I did my version of that. Um, I actually spent a couple of years as a youth minister, um, which a lot of people think, wow, that has nothing to do with book publishing. Um, to me, it actually has a lot to do with book publishing um, because it's about building relationships and understanding what's at the heart of humans and um, and engaging with them around it. So I did that for a couple of years, um, but I knew the whole time that my goal was to come to New York and work in children's books. Um, the problem is that I moved here in 2002, which was not long after 9-11 and the whole industry was in a hiring freeze. So I went on lots of interviews where people said, you're great, we're not hiring. Um, eventually I did finally get a job though. Um, it wasn't the job that I thought I wanted, I wanted to be an editor, um, but I ended up in a marketing job at Clarion Books, which is part of Houghton Mifflin. At the time it was just Houghton Mifflin, now it's Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, and it turned out to be one of the most secretly valuable things that ever could have happened to me because I realized very quickly that no one wanted me to write my English majory five paragraph essays about books and no one wanted me to even decide if I liked books or not. My job was to think about who the books were for, who the audience was and how to sell to them. Um, and so it really kind of recalibrated my whole point of view and has turned out to be um, ever since kind of a, a secret superpower, I think, because um, had I started as an editor on a floor with only other editors, I think it would have taken me longer to understand how the editing part of the puzzle fits into all the rest of publishing and how the publishing industry connects with uh, consumers and book buyers. Um, but I was seeing it sort of up close and personal. I also worked at a small imprint. Um, we were a team at that time of 14 or 15. And so I really kind of got to look over everybody's shoulders and understand how do all the different pieces of the industry connect to one another. Um, and I had a boss who'd been doing her job for 30 years and she was very good at it, but she was, you know, also was very happy to let me go do the things that I was excited about. So um, I learned a lot from that job and I got to interact with um, amazing authors and illustrators. Um, you know, I, I sometimes describe that first year that I worked in publishing as it was like every author who'd ever been my hero walking off my bookshelves into my email. <laughs> um, I, I still remember the first time I got an email from Katherine Patterson and I kind of lost my mind. Um, but so it was, it was rightly so, what an amazing uh, email to receive. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, so that was a great start, but I still wanted to be an editor. Um, and the problem 
uh, at the time was that, and still, uh, Clarion's a great place to work, and no one ever leaves. So there, you know, there weren't any spots coming open. Um, they let me put my hand into it a little bit. They basically said, "You seem really interested in this. If you want to do a little bit of working on books." Um, kind of on your own time, um, we'll let you do that. So I actually got to work with, you know, Dinah Stevenson and Virginia Buckley and some of the great editors on books like Gary Schmidt's books and, you know, um, really, really wonderful books and got to kind of just look over everyone's shoulders a little bit more closely, which just confirmed this is what I really want to do. Um, but every time I went on an interview, I got the response of, um, you're overqualified, but you're underqualified. So finally I thought, okay, if I'm gonna be stuck in marketing, I've had the little boutique in print experience, let's go get the big house experience. That way I can kind of decide for myself like what I want my path to look like. So I moved over to HarperCollins, still in the school and library marketing um, uh, vein, and did that for about another year and a half. I worked with a great team there, um, but finally I went to HR and I said, I work with great people, I'm working on great projects, but I'm on the wrong side of the table in every meeting. I'm working on very ephemeral things like reading group guides and author brochures, and I wanna be making things that last for 30 years, not the things that you know get stuffed into the, um, you know, the duffel bag and, and who knows when they get pulled out again. Um, and so eventually I was able to move over into an internal position. Um, I, I joined what was a short-lived imprint, although we didn't know it at the time, when Brenda Bowen, who's now a literary agent herself, um, started an imprint at HarperCollins, I moved over to be her assistant editor. It was just the two of us for a little while. We were joined by another editor. Um, then 2008 happened, which was the recession in publishing, and it hit publishing hard. And they ended up closing the imprint because it was so new that it was just an expense and there wasn't any income coming in from it. Um, luckily, they they laid off Brenda, but they kept um, the other editor, Anne, that I was working with uh, and me, and they moved us over to a different imprint. Um, and by that time, you know, so then, then we started working um, there. And by that time I was six or seven years in and I was like, let me at the books. I just want to be an editor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so when they, uh, finally let me start acquiring books. I hit the ground running in a way that I think no one really expected um, because I had been watching and waiting <laughs> uh, for my turn. And along the way, I had built up a lot of connections and a lot of um, relationships that mattered a lot to my books. Um, so the second book I ever signed up was a book that some folks might have heard of called Divergent. Um, and that series uh, ate my life for the next couple of years because it got um, pretty big, which was exciting, um, at times overwhelming, uh, but mostly really exciting. Um, I left- Divergent, was that was that a small indie title? I can't recall. A small, a small <laughs> little indie book. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and it was, it was a good time. Um, it, you know, it's interesting to see all the things you can do when a book becomes a conversation piece that everyone's cousin or aunt or sister-in-law is reading when you don't have to stop and explain the book to people, you know, when you can just engage in the conversation with them. And it's interesting to see, you know, um, what happens when, when a publisher puts a lot of resources in tandem with a movie studio's resources and it you know can can take over the world for a blip <laughs> um which you know or at least to a certain subset of kids the interesting thing is you know to us in publishing i mean that first book came out in 2011 which in publishing time is you know um both a blink uh and a really long time ago and the, the market's evolved a lot since um and you know, in, in terms of what the market is looking for now, it's very different things. But one of the sort of pleasant surprises of the last couple of years for me has been two things that teenagers, like new teenagers, today's 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds are still finding that series and reading it, which is pretty exciting to realize like, oh, it's it's living beyond its initial audience. You know, it's it's gone and refreshed the audience a couple of times. Um, 
And then the other thing that's caught me off guard, but is pretty delightful, is that um, I've had several uh, young editors tell me that they read that book in high school or in college, and now they're working in publishing, which um, says something about the way time passes for all of us, I suppose. Too fast, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so I left HarperCollins sort of to, to everyone's surprise, including my own, because I had an opportunity to go work for a startup. Um, and it was, um, I guess, in 2003, and it was around the time that uh, Random House and Penguin were emerging. It seemed like maybe there's going to be more mergers or maybe Amazon's going to eat the whole industry. Who really knows? And I had an opportunity to go get a whole different skill set, and it seemed wise. I had built up a relationship with a uh, tech startup that was publishing adjacent called Storybird. They invited me to come on board with them. They'd just gotten a big round of funding and, and basically said, come see what you can do here for a couple of years. Um, it was a great experience. I learned so much. I learned an entirely different paradigm of thinking. Um, in publishing, it's a very linear process to make a book. You have to pretty much do the same things in the same order every time with you know a small handful of variations of what can go differently. But you have to follow the same process every time because you need the end result to be books on the shelf. Um, whereas in tech, like all the rules are up for grabs all the time and in a startup especially. And you know, one minute you're thinking about the micro of here and now, and you know, you're five minutes later you're thinking about the macro of five years from now, and it, it felt like it made my brain a lot more nimble um, and also a lot more understanding of risk taking. I think, you know, um, tech, one of the things, there, there are many things I'm not sure about <laughs> with the tech world, but I think one of the things they get right is they understand failure differently than a lot of other industries, and they understand um, pending as just part of a growth process. And so if something's not working, or if users tell you that they want something different, you shift, you don't resist and resist. Um, so anyways, I learned a lot that was very interesting and that stretched my brain in really good ways. Um, I remember that, that couple of years telling people that it felt like my brain was just kind of on fire every day in a really good way. Um, but eventually, as happens with startups, especially when they are venture capital funded, you know, we didn't become the next Uber, we didn't become the next Airbnb, and you run out of funding, and it's time to reinvent. Um, so for me, um, figuring out, okay, what's my next move, I knew I could go back into the editorial side, or I had a pretty strong feeling that I would be able to find a job. Um, but I also knew that, you know, I um, was was curious about other things. My whole career, I had thought about agenting at different moments. And for a lot of the time, I had thought about agenting because I couldn't get to where I wanted to be as an editor. It was kind of a, you know, like, well, maybe this would be almost as good. Um, and I, I give a lot of credit to, you know, myself at like 25 and 32 or like whatever those ages were to realize like, that's not the right reason to choose agenting and, and something that I feel is really important is, you know, um, when you decide to work as an agent, you're you're taking on people's careers and you're taking their hopes and dreams into their hands. Um, you, of course, can't control everything, would that we could, but I knew it was something I didn't want to do lightly. It wasn't something I wanted to do if I wasn't really sure of myself or didn't have, you know, hadn't really thought it through. Um, but so anyways, at different at different moments, I had thought about agenting. Uh, at different moments, people had suggested it to me a lot because I'm sort of a, a natural connector of people. You know, I'm the person who's like, oh, I have a friend that does this thing and you seem interested in that and I should put you two together. Like, I just sort of naturally do that in my life. Um, Is that your uh, ministry skills coming into play, you think? Possibly. Um, one of the things that my boss pointed out when I worked at the startup and he said, you're a pattern matcher, which is not a term I ever had for myself, but it's one that I've very much embraced since. And it's another sort of secret as an agent for sure. So my brain is good at thinking about, okay, what's the analog of this thing in another, what's, what's a similar dilemma that's been encountered by the music industry, by the film industry, um, you know, what are what are other um, 
book projects list. I mean, the way that comes, you know, most obviously into play as an agent is, okay, if I'm putting a submission out there and I have this editor in mind of like, I think they're going to be the one that loves it. Then I ask myself, okay, who's the version of that editor at all the other houses? You know, who does that same kind of thing? And, you know, um, it can work out well. Um, so, so yeah, my brain just naturally sort of orders the world that way in, into finding finding the commonalities, I guess, finding the universalities of things, um, the center of things. Um, so um, after after thinking it through really hard, I decided, you know what, um, maybe maybe agenting wasn't the right thing for me at different earlier junctures, but maybe actually now it is. And and one of the things that I've been really grateful to realize over the last three years that I've been agenting, a little bit more than three, I guess, um, three and a half, is that it's in fact the thing that brings together all these weird sort of disparate roles I've held and hats I've worn and lets me pull it all together for the benefit of my clients and their books and their careers. Uh, and that's really gratifying because it's, it's nice to look behind yourself and be like, oh, there was something happening this whole time. I just didn't maybe see it. Um, but in, in hindsight, it's there. Anyways, that was a much longer winded version than I promised. <laughs> no, that was a, was a wonderful overview. And we'll, we'll, we're going to go back through and, and talk about kind of each of each of those steps. Uh, along the way, because I, I want to pick your brain just about publishing in general and all the um, uh, the experiences you've had, and the expertise that you're you're bringing to us this evening. Um, I uh, let's start. Um, so back uh, when you're getting going, you're you're seven years before you're in editing, and you knew you wanted to be an editor. Um, so for anybody that's that's in publishing, uh, that's listening to this, which I assume is a, a pretty large uh, portion of the audience, uh, and they're thinking, I want to be Molly O'Neill. How do I get there? How for those seven years where you're you're in the book industry, you're not you know you're not waiting tables and hoping to one day get there, but you're not doing what you want to do. How did you keep from getting bitter? How did you keep going, especially when 2008 happens and it seems like the whole world is going to fall apart and we're all going to be in breadlines, uh, and so there's no point in, in, in worrying maybe about anything business wise. Uh, how did you keep going and persevere through that? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think, and and so I teach a, at a course for the last couple summers I've done this. Um, I, I teach at Columbia's publishing course. So that's a six weeks intensive course for mostly fairly recent college grads. Um, I would say primarily folks in their 20s or maybe early 30s at the most who've decided they want to work in the book publishing industry or in magazine publishing um, or web publishing. It kind of covers a, a couple different areas. Um, and so I go and, and I'm on faculty for the book portion of it. And one of the things that I regularly tell the students there or, um, you know, give as advice to people in informational interviews, things like that, is that there's stuff to learn at every role, you know, um, you can learn a ton about being an editor, even if you're not an editor, you can learn a ton about um, business communication, you can, and in a way you can learn it with a little bit less emotion involved, a little bit more remove. Uh, publishing is mostly a written industry. So if you want to follow along and you're already working like under a boss, um, you can you can see their emails, you can see records of the editorial letters, you can kind of trace the path of how this happens. And in fact, one of one of the better um, pieces of wisdom I've collected along the way was I, I had myself an interview, more of just an informational conversation. It wasn't really an interview because she didn't have a position open with uh, an editor who I regard really highly, Wendy Lamb, when I was trying to move into um, the editorial side of things. And I was asking her, you know, at that point, I had a good few years in as a marketing um, person. And so I was asking, you know, like, do you think I can skip some steps? Do I have to go all the way back <laughs> to like the beginning? You know, really don't, don't collect go, or don't pass go, don't collect $200, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> And what she said is to be an editor, you have to walk in the pencil marks of another editor for a very long time, um, which I think is just so beautifully 
articulated. But editing and, and really all of publishing in a very different way than a lot of other industries is an apprenticeship based industry. And you can go to one of the publishing courses like the one that I help at, at Columbia or there's one in Denver, there's a couple others. Um, and it's a jump start. But in terms of learning how to do the actual work every day of the publishing industry, the only way you learn that is on the job. Um, and by just being interested and curious about everything, by taking on extra tasks so you can figure out what they're all about or because they allow you to get FaceTime with someone you know, higher up who you might not otherwise have an opportunity to have a conversation with, um, and and really that same sort of curiosity and openness is the same thing you need to become an editor who's looking for talent everywhere or an agent who's looking for talent everywhere. It's just kind of like your antenna's always up. Um, I, I once heard my former boss, Brenda Bowen, described by someone very aptly as she said, you know, like she acquires books, but she also acquires um, and I thought that was a really uh, a good summation. Um, and I, I think that's part of what actually we're doing as an industry is, is uh, we're, we're collecting and giving voice to interesting people who have interesting ideas or stories to tell, particularly the ones that haven't been heard enough or prominently um, before. And, and we're amplifying them and giving giving them an opportunity to speak makes sense to me so it's uh just kind of at any stage in the career try and be the best possible version of that person you can be because it's a small industry and people are watching am i hearing that right yeah and and you can be learning um at, at any given moment. You, you never learn everything there is to learn in publishing, you know, you never ascend totally to the to the top. Every book is its own puzzle. Oh, I assume after you're the editor of... for Divergent, you've ascended. You're there. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that's your resume now. You just walk into places. Divergent, done. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I don't think it's that simple, but I also wouldn't want it to be that simple. You know, there would be something um, sad if I only focused on this thing that I did, you know, early in my career, like I intend to have a career that lasts for decades, I have everything to focus on something that I did you know, six, seven years in. Um, I won't say by accident, because it, it was it was very intentional. But, um, you know, I look at that, and I think it was amazing. But it was also hopefully just me getting started. And, you know, and I sometimes joke to people, I mean, I, I have a lot of affection and admiration for that series and what it was and, and who the author has become. Um, but I, I, in a way, as an editor, accident, what I really was trying to do was like, find the next Newberry winner or Caldecott winner, you know? So it's like, there's always, in fact, I, I just had an editor lunch with someone who um, showed me, I thought she was just casually using this term, but then she pulled it up on her phone and showed me that she has a personal editor bingo of like things that she really wants to accomplish or have happen for her books. And, you know, basically it's like, if all of these things happen for um, books of mine, then like I too will have gotten to experience a lot of different things. So a whole variety of things, you know, from like bestsellers and awards to, you know, wanting uh, a book turned into a movie or wanting a book that, um, you know, there's a, a special edition made for, you know, there's a whole list of things, but it was, it was kind of delightful. And I think most people in publishing have high ambition like that um, to, to keep learning and to keep growing. I think one of the other really good pieces of advice I got along the way in my career was from Maria Madunio, who's a brilliant editor, mostly of picture books at Random House. And, but she worked at Harper when I worked at Harper. And um, sometimes I would go to her, I didn't work directly under her, but we had built up a rapport. And so sometimes I would go to her and ask for her wisdom, her advice. And it was when I was thinking about moving to the editorial position, in fact. And um, I asked her, you know, I'm, I'm seven years in, if I put in a couple more years, like I have a pretty swanky title, 
what are people going to think of me if I back up and like, you know, have an assistant title all over again? Like what are, what are people going to perceive from that? Does it matter? And she said, you know, in this business, it's small. It's, we joke, it's incestuous. Everyone moves around all the time and you're doing good. If you can remember like, wait, where's that person now? And what you remember about them is the kind of books they make and the authors that are associated with them along the journey, no one remembers anyone's actual title on their business card. And so her advice to me was make your name your title, um, which is advice that I have both carried with me and given away to a lot of other people because when you recalibrate things as, um, you know, what are the projects that I, and, and the authors and the ideas that, I want to have associated with me, that's a different question than just, will this book sell? Um, and so it's not the only thing certainly that I think about, but it is one thing that I think about is if you look at, you know, um, the books that are associated with me, what, what picture does that paint? And it's something that I think about as I'm taking on clients, as I'm signing up things, as I'm, I'm deciding what, projects to focus on. Makes sense to me. Um, one more uh, question about Divergent and we'll, we'll leave it alone. <laughs> um, but you know, that's, that's, that's the book that I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard of. Some mm -hmm. folks have watched the movie. Uh, and I have uh, one of my most embarrassing stories uh, is involves Divergent uh, because I, um, I, I, I lead a fiction workshop here uh, you know, I, I help uh, authors that, that are, are soon to be authors uh, critique each other's work. And I always start off by saying um, that one, art is subjective. Uh, so everything we're talking about is a matter of opinion. There are some opinions that are probably better than others. But at all, when you come right down to it, it's art. It's got to be subjective. Uh, and I've been colossally wrong before, and I will be wrong again. Uh, so anytime you, you hear me say anything about your writing, just bear in mind that I've been wrong before. And the example I use is I met Veronica Ross here and uh, she was at a conference uh, the Midwest Writers Workshop here in uh, uh, in Muncie, Indiana uh, and I met her and I met uh, Joanna Volpe who of course became her agent and we uh, we both wanted to talk to, to Joanna the, the whole conference and uh, she shared with me kind of her um, query for Divergent we were talking about her books and I was working on a, a different book about aliens which she thought was ridiculous and she told me about her book and I said well that just sounds like Harry Potter uh, and so every time I start a workshop like bear in mind I gave Veronica Roth the harshest shutdown ever and I have been eating my words for years ever since like oh how could you have been so wrong so you you had the insight uh what is that experience when that when that um, book comes across your desk that's that's, that's destined for great things, uh, despite what 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 ninjas in Indiana might think about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, you talk. I'm assuming you talked with Joanna Volpe, who we know was a very successful literary agent and uh, and, a, and a wonderful person to communicate with. Um, what is that experience like? And is there something about that particular book that stands out amongst the other books where you say, yes, this must be the one? or there's none of that and you're surprised afterward or is it somewhere in between? Well, so I'll talk about Divergent, but also sort of how it extrapolates larger because I'm, I'm assuming some of the folks watching this are curious not only about other people's books, but their own and, oh, and that, <laughs> that whole thing. Um, so let's see, um, I'm trying to think where to begin with this. With, with Divergent, so in terms of why it worked for me, um, it's funny because publishing moves very slowly and it takes several years from the moment you sign a book up to it being on the shelves. So some people looked at that book and thought, oh, it's, you know, basically Harry or uh, Harry Potter uh, or Hunger Games, you know, that there were um, pieces of DNA of other things in it. But in fact, the moment that I signed it up, we were still in the paranormal thing that happened post Twilight. And for me as an editor, I didn't raise myself reading paranormal books. Um, they weren't something that I was drawn to. I, When I first started editing it, I tried very hard to like care about them or understand them or get into them because that's what was hot. And 
what I realized with the help of some of my mentors and also just, you know, some, some soul searching was that like, those aren't the kind of stories that I'm good at. They're not the kind of stories that I ever personally connected to or cared about. And that, you know, I could fight really hard to learn how to do something and maybe be okay at it. But there were already people at HarperCollins doing that kind of book really well, really successfully. And so the conversation I sort of had with myself was like, okay, figure out what you actually can be good about at, figure out what you what you care about and go after that because like trends don't last forever. I think we knew a lot less about trends in YA because the market was so much younger then, but even then we knew, you know, this, this won't last forever. Um, and so I thought about the books that were intriguing to me, which were actually somewhat different than the books that I grew up reading. Um, but I realized that what was really like chewy to me as an editor and, and sort of like interesting to get my claws into were things that took the world as we knew it and did something unexpected and skewed it. Um, and, you know, whether you skew it 30 degrees, like that's a very different story than if you skew it 163 degrees is different than if you skew it 240 degrees. Like each of those is a very different book. Whereas for me and, and people who understand the nuances of, of paranormal romance might very much disagree with me. So I mean no disrespect, but to me, the arc of a paranormal romance pretty much always looked the same. And I realized I want more unexpectedness in the stories that I'm working on. Uh, so I started telling agents when I was meeting with them, uh, you know, send your, your fairies and your werewolves and your sparkly everythings to all the editors at HarperCollins who do that really well, send me your sort of, we weren't even using the term dystopian yet. It, it wasn't even a thing yet. Um, it said, send me your speculative things that are that are doing interesting, unexpected things. And I saw a lot of books, you know, as, as a result of those conversations, some of which did go on to be published very successfully that were kind of YA versions of The Handmaid's Tale. Um, and to me, that wasn't, quite the thing that I was looking for because I thought, you know, I understand why this storytelling is interesting, you know, uh, futuristic unpacking of questions about female sexuality and reproduction, in a, you know, high pressure world. Like, I understand why that's appealing to 20 and 30 somethings in New York City. I'm less convinced and I think I might feel differently about it today in the climate that we're in. But um, at the time, I felt like I don't know if that's what 14 and 15 year olds in you know, Idaho or California or um, North Dakota are really paying as much attention to. Um, so when Divergent came to me, I had a very like in the core of me reaction of this is a story that's going to resonate so widely because the premise at the heart of it was this idea that you make a choice and, and we put it everywhere. I mean, we turned it into the tagline. We put it into the marketing copy, this idea one choice can transform you. And to me, that's the heart of this story is, is you make a choice and then everything after that, you're changed forever. The world is changed forever. Um, I think to teenagers, that's an empowering message that, you know, that their choices matter. Um, but I also think it's something that everyone can relate to. You know, you, are familiar with making choices that feel monumental, whether you're a teenager yourself, you know, like that question doesn't go away, whether it's who do I go to the high school prom with, or who do I marry, or what is my college degree, or, you know, where should I live, or who should I be? Like those big questions continue. So to me, that was the thing that really, um, triggered in my brain was how, how far reaching and how, sweeping of an audience there could be for this idea. You're not wrong that it has some shades of Harry Potter in it. No, um, I am extremely wrong. <laughs> and I should quickly clarify, um, Miss Roth, should you be watching all these years <laughs> later, uh, the jerk in Indiana who made the mean comment apologizes a thousand times over. I've read the book and the sequels. They're great stuff. It was, it was very different from just reading the query and your description to reading the actual novel. Great stuff. Continue. <laughs> well, but what I was going to say is what was interesting with that book is we saw, um, it was actually one of the most fascinating parts to me, as it was gaining 
attention and prominence and readers. You know, once it was all the editorial and marketing and everything was done and it was out in the world finding its way, we started seeing that. Um, and again, we didn't quite have the words for this in the same way in 2011, 10, whatever it was that we did now, but we kept, we saw all the fandoms come to it for different reasons. And so Harry Potter fans, who of course, um, at that point, I think all of the books were out and all the movies were out and the newer Harry Potter stuff that JK Rowling did hadn't bubbled up yet. So they were seeing something that felt familiar to them with the sort of sorting hat mechanism and the, and the identity personality things and gravitating toward that. Um, Twilight fans were seeing a little bit of like the, the romance and the, the yearning that they had really connected to in Twilight um, and were coming to it for that reason. Harry Potter or um, Hunger Games fans were a little more divided because they were still waiting on some of their movies. So I always said like they didn't need a new fandom in quite the same way that the that the fans from other properties had. But so we really kind of collected them all, um, and and they all found what they were looking for in the Divergent series, which I think was absolutely some of its power. Um, so I don't know if that entirely answers your question or if, if there's a, a follow-up um, about the specifics of that. Um, it definitely gives us a good overview of the strategy and why it would, would be appealing to you. Um, again, having having read the full book, that's <laughs> the query. Um, but um, well, then was, me... there, was there ever a feeling like where a holy light sh shined down on the manuscript <laughs> and you heard a choir singing and like, yes, this is the one? Was there anything like that? I mean, for me, that was the experience of reading it the first time. So um, Joe Volpe and I had had lunch. We talked about my interest. She called. She pitched the book to me. Um, I started reading it that same night on the train um, on my Sony e-reader, my first generation Sony e-reader. <laughs> and... Um, and I remember, so at the time our offices were at 55th Street and I started reading and by 33rd Street, I had basically gotten through the first scene and the writing was kind of making me tingle. And, you know, it was sort of like, like I was like a, a very attentive, you know, awake to this story. Um, and I kept reading and um, to me, there was such a strength and control in Veronica's writing. Um, those first few scenes of Divergent are when she has lived her whole life in abnegation, this very controlled, clipped version of herself. And the cadence of the writing absolutely matches that. Um, short sentences, very little emotion. And as she makes her choice, which I won't spoil it for anyone, although you're behind the times if you haven't read it. No, but you might be 15, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> I take it back. Uh, new fans coming to it all the time, it's a good thing. Um, but as, as her world starts to get bigger and more daring, the language starts to get bigger, the sentence structure starts to get more complex. And so Initially, I was noticing some of the artistic things she was doing, as well as being pretty swept up in the story, because again, there, there hadn't been, um, certainly there had been speculative fiction and dystopian books, especially in the adult market. There had been the first Hunger Games book, I think, had come out very recently before, um, but we didn't have the, the depth and the breadth of it that we do now. So it was a less familiar story in a way, this idea of, a girl rising up against, uh, you know, society gone wrong and and trying to figure out how to save it. We hadn't quite seen so much of that in 2009 or whenever it, it came to me. So so within the first 20 blocks on my subway ride home, I, I was noticing it, that it felt like a different reading experience than most things that had come into my inbox. Um, at the time, my subway ride, so... Um, Cell phones didn't work on subways until very recently, and even now it's still sort of spotty, but definitely back in um, 2009, they didn't work at all. But my subway ride had this like two minute thing where it went above ground, and so you'd watch out, everyone pull out their phone and like do their texting or their calling or their messaging before it went back underground. And so I was one of them that night, I called and texted, or I, I texted my friend that I was supposed to have dinner with, canceled my dinner plans because I wanted to keep reading. And I went and sat in this little 
coffee, wine sort of shop in my neighborhood. And I read until they closed, which I think was like midnight or 1 a.m. I kept reading and I kept reading until three or four in the morning when I finished it. Um, and I stumbled in and was completely inarticulate about what was so amazing, but like, and it's a complicated story to like sum up. Um, but I knew it, it would have been electrifying as a reading experience. And I knew that if I had had that reading experience, probably other people were gonna have that reading experience, which I think, you know, I said, I wanted to extrapolate this out to other people. Um, one of the things that I find that I always do when I'm reading manuscripts, and this very much goes back to my editorial or my marketing uh, sensibility, is that when I finish reading something that I've liked, the very next question that shows up in my brain, you know, not even like it's automatic at this point. It's not like I even have to stop and think about it. It's just my brain is trained that the next question is, who's it for? Like you loved it, who's it for? And if I, you know, and this was true as an editor, it's true as an agent in a little bit of different ways. If I don't know who it's for, who's the reader for that? Who's the first constituency that's going to fall in love with it in terms of publishing stuff? You know, is it is this a book that independent booksellers are going to get really behind and you know, hand sell it to be a word of mouth sort of thing? Is this something that's you know going to it's got a plot that's going to mean it gets optioned to be a film really quickly and and things start moving and people hear about it that way? Is it something that? Um, you know, like that librarians are going to get behind and it's going to potentially get awards or it's going to be on state reading lists and that's how people are going to hear about it. But like, where is the starter audience for a book is a really important question. Um, and if I can't answer that question, if, if it's, I liked the reading experience, but I can't understand who the audience for this would be, or if my feeling is, there might be an audience, but it's a particularly small niche, um, then I probably don't have the right vision to be involved with that project. Um, because I think you owe a responsibility to have a, a book a responsibility if you're gonna acquire it or agent it, um, that you have a vision for it, you have a plan. It doesn't always mean that it works out. It doesn't always mean that the market agrees with you, but you should, I don't want to go in all willy nilly and be like, maybe this will work. I guess we'll try. You know, like I want there to be more, more strategy to it than that. Um, and so for me, that was an early experience of having that experience of I know exactly who this book is for. And it was also sort of the, the rare experience of this is a book for a lot of those constituencies all at the same time, all at the beginning. It's for the librarians at the same time that it's for the independent booksellers at the same time. It's for, you know, your your uncle who only reads two books a year, you know? Um, and that, that sense of audience, I think is a really important one. As an editor, it was, how am I going to sell this book internally to my team, which in turn is going to be how they sell it externally. So you know, part of your job as an editor is to, um, from the moment you bring a book into acquisition, sort of show, show the vision for it. And if it works, then the sales reps share that vision with the booksellers and the booksellers share that with consumers. And like, that's how word of mouth spreads. Sometimes I do a presentation at writing conferences where I, I show projects where there are certain phrases from the query letter, if it's, you know, a strong query letter um, that I use on in my pitch to editors that they use in their flat copy that, you know, um, ends up in the hands of readers, you know, because that vision has been so clear, even sometimes starting with the author themselves. Um, at the risk of seeing those phrases show up in every query you ever receive <laughs> uh, going forward, can you give us a couple of examples? Oh, it's it's not like there's a, a set of magic words. It's just that the the ideas have been encapsulated so well. Um, let's see. Um, Darius the Great is not okay, which is a YA novel that um, I agent. Um, that I represent that came out last year. Uh, the flap copy, the first line here is uh, 
Darius Kellner speaks better Klingon than Farsi, and he knows more about Hobbit social cues than Persian ones. That is almost word for word identical to um, part of his pitch letter to me. And it just encapsulated it so clearly. So I put it in my pitch letter to editors and his lucky editor, Dana, who acquired the book, um, recognized that she couldn't say it any better. And that's really what it boils down to is sometimes there's something that the author says so well that no one else can say it better. And so it ends up, you know, all the way into the hands of readers. Sometimes an author, I think, um, has a closeness to the project where they're they're describing a book very accurately, but they're not thinking with the lens of a consumer yet. They or they don't know how to think with the lens of a librarian. So sometimes the copy changes a lot. So it's not like you know you you've done something extra special if it works this way. It's just interesting um, that that sometimes they've captured it right from the beginning. So when you get a book that you love, but you can't immediately answer that all important question of who's it for, what's the plan mm -hmm. to get it out in the world and make sure the, the audience finds it. Um, how often do you take this book that you love and say, well, if we can make this change, this change and this change, maybe I have the answers to that question without destroying what it is you love about it initially. Usually if I don't have a sense at all of who the audience is for, it boils down to the fact that I'm not the right person to work on it. Um, and I will put that in, in kindly worded rejection letters to, to authors that I don't have the vision um, to know what to do with this book. But I, I am one player in the publishing world and there are as many of us as there are, you know, representative of different types of readers. So I think, you know, a, a question agents get asked a lot is like, oh, tell us about the one that got away, you know? Um, <laughs> but the truth of it is like the one that got away or the one that we turned down that's gone on to be a smash hit, a lot of the time would not have been the smash hit in our hands because maybe we would have never thought to submit it to the editor that that agent did. Or we never would have thought to tease out that one layer of the story that was the thing that readers connected to so clearly. So like, you know, it's like trying on an outfit, like some things just don't look good on you, but they look great on someone else. And so I think it's um, important to acknowledge that, you know, I, um, I want to work on projects that I see clearly that I can be a value add to them um, and that I have a strategy and a vision that of course is going to change and get shaped by the market and all sorts of things over time, but that like there's a a clear path in my mind to where we're trying to go and how we're going to get there. And if, you know, other, if I tried to take on something that I didn't have vision for, it would be like, well, I see the end that I want to get to, which is, you know, smash success, awards, lots of copies in the world, but I have no idea what roads to take to get me there. And the chances are strong that I might even try to take us down roads that don't work successfully. That makes sense. I think, uh, well, this, this also makes sense. Holly Root said something uh, very similar, and she also mentioned the uh, the dumb uncle phenomenon. That's what you want your, your books to, to reach the dumb uncles who only read one or two books a year. Um, th this idea that um, that if it's meant to happen, it happens because you're the person that should be the, the guide for that book. And if you're not feeling that, then you're not the person. And it's cool that it finds somebody else and they find the, the success for the book, right? Yeah, and you know, I sometimes have done a, a workshop at, at writers' conferences about rejection, um, which, you know, on the one hand, I'm surprised anyone actually willingly shows up for that session. Um, like, sure, talk to me for an hour and a half about rejection. But I also think it's really important because we talk a lot in writers' conferences and blogs and podcasts, all of these things about like the things to do in like the hopeful place and in the actively trying place, we don't talk as much as an industry. It's, it's sort of like we were saying earlier about tech and failure and that they have a different understanding of, of that phenomenon. Was I having that conversation with you? Yes. I 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think I also had that conversation with someone else earlier today. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, in, Indianapolis is actually a huge tech city. I think we're number three in the country right now. My wife works in tech. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we go to the Mira Awards every year, which is like nerd Oscars, where they mm -hmm. go and they, they give uh, awards to all the, the startups. And sometimes we see them get stand up and give a speech and they go on to become a great country. Uh, company and sometimes it's good that they got to get that speech because the company doesn't <laughs> exist. The only one. Yeah. Um, so so anyways, I, I feel like sometimes we don't talk enough about what to do when you get rejections and what what it means and and how to move forward from that. And I think it's important for authors and illustrators and people who are out querying their projects to know that it's it's not personal. If you get rejections, sometimes it's exactly what I was just describing. It's me saying, I can't do right by this. I shouldn't be the one that takes it on. Um, you know, sometimes um, I don't have the bandwidth to take it on. Um, but that it's not a personal, um, there's not the emotion in it, I think, from the side of the editor and agent that there is for the author. And of course, it's hard for the author or the illustrator to separate the, you know, this is this thing they created. Of course, there's emotion around it. But I think it's important to know that it's it's not a rejection of you as a creator. It's literally an agent or an editor saying, I don't have a vision for this. I don't see a place for this. There is a market that exists created by forcers much larger than me. And I don't know how to bend them to make this book work. Um, so I think sometimes this is much an admission of our own limitations as it is a commentary on a writer's strengths or abilities. And I think sometimes um, writers submit wanting to hear an affirmation that this is where they should be putting their time instead of spending it on another hobby or with their family or with their loved ones, or they, um, they, they want a signal um, you know, we, we all go through school. We're used to having someone tell us if we're doing a good job. And I think sometimes that's what people are looking for when they go on submission. I mean, of course, they're looking for a yes and they're looking for, you know, here's the road to, to success. Um, but I think emotionally, sometimes they're looking for affirmation, confirmation. And unfortunately, that's not what the submission process is built for because it's never our job to say, whether or not we think you should be spending your time on this. That's that's something that can only come from you. Um, it's never our job to tell you if you're talented or not. You know, like those are, um, that's the mechanics of the submission process, which is literally you asking the question, do you see a way to successfully publish this book in the market is, and, an agent or an editor is saying yes or no. And it's it's that simple, but I think sometimes people put a lot more um, meaning into it or take away rejection of on like on an intrinsic level um, as a human, as a creative person that is not intended by people in publishing. And it's an unfortunate byproduct. I don't know how we change that. Um, but I think it's good just to remember that like, this is a, this is a business letter you're sending. It's a business question. Do you see this product working in the market? And the answer that comes back is a business response. Sure. But I'm not writing saying, Hey, can I, uh, sell you four o'clock radios. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> my, my whole heart's in this thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I, I don't think I've ever been uh, rejected uh, by you. I've certainly received uh, rejections <laughs> previously. And I remember uh, days when I come home, I, I'm old enough that we were still doing all the self-addressed stamped envelopes. Yep. Uh, and I'd get four or five of them with my handwriting on them in, in a night. And I come home like, oh, it's going to be a rough night. Uh, and you need to go through them like uh, Charlie opening up the chocolate bars, hoping to find a gold ticket like dear Lord, please. Um, with your rejections, I mean, are you using, I, I assume just by sheer volume, you'd have to use form responses for a lot of them, correct? Yeah. Our, our agency primarily uses form responses. Um, and as with many agencies, um, there is not 
the time and the day and there is no one to pay us for um, giving deeply thoughtful responses. And we might steer you wrong because if we had the vision for what you needed to do, we'd be having a different conversation. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so our, you know, we, we do, um, some agencies are no response means no, and we do very, try very hard to at least um, send the response. We have, you know, for anyone who queries us, we have an auto responder. Right when you send it in, you get a, a ping back that tells you it was received. This is our current turnaround time. The turnaround time isn't always accurate. You know, um, we can't always gauge where our focus is going to need to be for our clients, and that comes first. Um, but it lets you know it got there. <laughs> um, and, you know, similarly, we, we try hard to um, get an answer to people eventually. And so when you do write rejections that are personal, um, do you include feedback? What should authors be taking away from a rejection that's anything other than dear author, not for mm -hmm. us? Yeah, I think if you can tell that the, um, the agent or the editor has really engaged with the story and is trying to, to understand what your goals are and how they could help you better achieve it, because that's really what the editorial process is. And it's taken me, you know, there are certain things that have taken me most of my career to be able to articulate. And I think this is one of them is that um, the editorial process is really all about you have a vision of the story in your head, man, but like it's alive in your head. When you're transcribing it onto paper, inevitably there's a gap between the version that's alive in your head and what you get onto the paper. An editor's role is to come and to see what you got onto the paper without having access to the version that's in your head and to ask you the questions and point out things that help you close the gap even more between the two. So they are ultimately trying to help you better tell the story that you were initially trying to tell all along. They just have a different tool set to do it and they don't have as much closeness. You know, they don't, they, they have a bit of distance which can be very valuable. Um, and so that's, that's really part of what the editor's brain or the agent's brain is thinking about is when they're reading something is, do I know the right questions to ask to strengthen this, to, to make it more itself? It's not, and I think this is a fear of a lot of authors or illustrators, particularly ones that haven't gone through um, a publishing house's editorial process before. It's not an editor saying, well, here's what I'd do with your characters. You know, I'd make them like go to the dance. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like I'd actually have these two get together instead. It's it's not um, it's not an editor trying to write fan fiction <laughs> in their mind about your story. It's them trying to really comprehend what your goals are and see what they can do to help you get even closer. Um, I, I tell clients um, that, you know, when we first start wor working together, it's gonna feel like a lot of me crawling around inside their brain because I'm trying to understand what they're thinking about, what, what's, what inside of them is compelling them to tell this particular story. How are we getting all of that? on the page. Um, so how, uh, how, did, how, how would that process go if you've just signed somebody and you're trying to crawl in their head? What kind of questions are you asking? What enables you to do that? It's different for every project. Unfortunately, again, there's not one easy answer, which is, you know, the sad anthem Come of our Molly, I want easy answers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like this is, if it were widgets, man, um, it would all work so much differently. <laughs> it would all get paid more. It would all be We've all be totally different. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna segue for a second and come back to the question you're asking. Sometimes um, clients ask, and I think this is a common um, thing that's talked about writers, writers talk together about this when they're looking for an agent. They say, are you an editorial agent? And I think um, for me, they sort of assume that I am because I have a whole background as an editor. But, and again, this is one of these things that I couldn't have told you three years ago 
when I started agenting, but I, I understand it about myself now is I'm never looking to do the editor's job. Uh, and in fact, I'm very aware from having been on the other side of the table that I can't do all the fun parts and then try to sell a book. You know, I can't try to sell already chewed gum. Um, it's not to say that a perfect book wouldn't get acquired. Of course it would, you know, and, and um, you could get it onto a publishing schedule sooner. You could get it out faster if like a book came to an editor needing no work done. But at the same time, something would be lost in that process because part of what makes an editor say yes to something is they see the role that they can play in it. They see, I think I have exactly the right key to help the writer unlock the thing that's not working yet. You know, like I understand a lot about plot or I understand a lot about character. I realize that if you just took out this character that seems important but is actually distracting from the emotional growth, whatever it is, like they see the value that they can bring to it. That's what gets them excited because editors go into the job of editing wanting to live inside stories all day. And instead, they spend most of their day living inside conference rooms, having meetings, and, and effectively being project managers inside a corporation. So when they get to really sit down and do the work of editing, that's the part they love best. That's the part that keeps them in the job. So my role isn't to steal that or, um, or to do it for them, because also, you know, most projects would be a different book. If you handed it to five different editors, you'd end up with five very different books because each of those editors would see the road a little differently. Um, so what I have realized for myself as an agent, my job, I, I describe myself as a developmental agent. Um, and by that, I mean that I can get involved at the early stage of a story. I'm never doing the line editing. I'm never tweaking word for word, sentence for sentence. What I'm looking at is the entire shape of the story and, and the movement of the story, the pacing, the, the emotional arc, the plot. And I'm thinking about um, how to get it to the point where the potential is strong enough to make an editor say yes to it, but all of the joy has not already happened, which is, a very nebulous line and different for every project. Uh, <laughs> but it's, um, to me, it's it's the important creative part of the work, or one of, one of the important creative parts of the work I do is helping, I, and I tell my clients two things. I tell them, we're gonna edit this, we're gonna work on it, we're gonna develop it, you know, until I don't know what the rejection letters are going to say which doesn't mean that we won't get them. <laughs> um, but if I can already anticipate that half the rejections we are gonna get are gonna say, this character's underdeveloped emotionally, or uh, the plot gets really dense and confusing in the middle, or the ending didn't feel satisfying in terms of a trade-off for everything that it took us to get there. You know, if I already know what an editor is gonna say no to, I'm gonna work with the author to fix it because we only get to have so many um, chances to put it into the editor's hands and have it be the first time they read it and get excited about it and hopefully move it forward. So we work on it in that way, which is different than the way an editor works on it. They're, they're thinking about different questions, even though they're related. Um, they're thinking a little bit more about the end reader. I am as well, because naturally I'm thinking about that question of audience, but my first audience as an editor is how do we get, or as an agent, my first audience as an agent is the editor. How do we get the editor to say yes to it? Because if we don't, it doesn't matter if I can see what the librarians are gonna think and what the booksellers are gonna think. Well, the first person we have to literally sell it to is the editor in the publishing house. So that's are you my. Thinking of just the editor? Are you also thinking of the people that they've got to go then and take yeah. it to get approval to as yeah. well? And how do you separate the two in your mind? Um. Well, I think the editors that I try to submit to are ones that I know are good at doing that part of their job, which is an entirely different skill set but understanding how to maneuver the machine that is a publishing company um, 
how to rally all of the folks behind it. I, I was just today um, with with a client who uh, we we had a meeting with the publishing house, and it was the first time most of the publisher was was meeting this editor, or I'm sorry, was meeting this author, um, and it was the editor knowing that the sales people and the marketing people and the subsidiary rights people and the special sales people that hearing this author talk about some of their previous life experience was going to be valuable in helping um, sell the book ultimately. So she asked the author to come in and do a presentation, which would give each of these different um, professionals what they needed to do their job better. So this particular, I, I don't feel like it's my place to go into too much identifying information, which is why I'm being a little vague, but um, this particular author had a background um, working for some corporations that the special sales team, who their job is to sell books into any place that's not a bookstore. So special sales sells books into places like Anthropology or Urban Outfitters or Crate and Barrel or um, the you know National Park gift shop, you know, all the places that like, oh yeah, there's a couple books there, but there's not like endless books there. Um, so for them hearing that this uh, author had had some experience working for some of those corporations, gave them a certain uh, ammunition to go into their meetings with some of those buyers for. Um, similarly, hearing some of the things about creative process gave the sales reps um, a story to tell when they go to their buyers at the bookstores, they can talk about, you know, they they heard some things about how this author came to write their books in the first place and um, what what the personal part of the story was for the author. So everyone's sort of collecting the, the nugget they need to go do their job better. Makes sense. And you can definitely hear how your time as an editor is very definitely informing um, your, your <laughs> life as a literary agent. Because one, I've, I've never heard the insight that make sure you save some of the fun for the editor. That's fantastic. Uh, but also, it sounds like you're kind of helping to arm these editors with the ammunition they need ahead of time to make sure your, your deal gets done. Or am I, am I not hearing that correctly? Yeah. Right, right? yeah. Um, when, when publishing works best, we are all on the same team, the author, the agent, the editor, their team, like we're all pulling together for the sake of the project. Sometimes things go off kilter and we're not able to be on the same team or, you know, I'm having to stand up for the author's needs and um, ahead of the publisher's needs, you know, so sometimes like there are situations that are not so perfect and beautiful, but when it's working at its best version, we're all together building this thing. And so if I can particularly understanding, I think it's absolutely one of my strengths as an agent is that I understand and have sat in every meeting. And so I know the difference between when an editor says, we're taking your book to pre-sales or we're taking your book to launch or your book is going to ALA or it's going to uh, SIBA or NIBA or you know, all of these like little things that sort of sound the same to someone who hasn't lived and breathed them. Um, I think for me, because I understand what each of those events is, what the audience, and that's very much, again, um, a part of it is, who are we talking to at this meeting? Um, and that was part of the conversation that this uh, client and I had when, when they were putting together a presentation for it. We talked about certain parts of the initial, you know, draft of the presentation that um, this client did. And, you know, if you were talking to a, a room full of other creators, you're talking to other authors and illustrators, some of this might matter. Um, you know, she had initially gone deep into some of the creative process stuff. And we decided to pull back on that a little bit because that wasn't this room, that wasn't this audience. This audience was professionals. And so understanding some of her own professional journey was more important. So I think because I speak the language of um, inside a publishing house and I speak the language of authors, I can 
translate between the two and uh, hopefully my clients feel less confused by it all because it's it's an overwhelming big process from the outside and i think as an agency you know with with root literary one of the things that we all believe very much in is um we want our clients to be as educated about what's going on with their books as they want to be and as they're able to be um some people you know love to have all the data some people know that at a certain point it just freaks them out more so we also it's not a one size fits all thing, um, but we want our clients to have the knowledge of what's going on and, and education is part of what we are bringing to the table as an agency because we believe very strongly that the more you know about what's going on in your the life of your book or your publishing career, wherever you are, your submission process, um, the more you know what's going on, the more confident you feel. Um, you're not spending all your time cycling on questions about well, what if this, and I don't understand what they meant when they said that. And, you know, uh, should I ask this? Like when, when there's less focus on confusion, there's more confidence. And when there's more confidence, there's the ability to make better art because that's also something that our clients have to be doing while the publishing process is happening for one book over here, they need to be working on a next project over here. And so we are working to educate them enough that they feel confident about their the career hat, that they can set that down and fully devote themselves to the thing that only they can do, which is create the next book. Um, similarly, something I, I tell my clients is that you know I wear a lot of different hats you know, as an agent, like I'm negotiating your contracts, I'm educating you, I'm helping you develop your projects, I'm you know uh, talking you off creative ledges, whatever it, it may be. Um, but the thing that I think is the most valuable thing I do is I help my clients protect their creative space um, because there's a lot that I can handle for them. I you know, that's why we do the negotiating and the contract stuff and, you know, the business piece of it. Like that's a large part of what agents are doing is handling the business parts of your career, which doesn't mean that you should set it and forget it and never think about it. Um, but if you have the confidence that someone else is handling whatever's happening, even if it's like something's happening for, you know, the book that's in the publishing process that it might feel like it's on fire a little bit. Um, if you if you have the confidence that my agent is handling that, you're able to give yourself the space to be focused on the creative work that will potentially, hopefully become your next book and help you build a career and not just the one book. I think that anyone who's uh, listening to this uh, conversation is going to get a sense very quickly that oh, Molly O'Neill, uh, if, if I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with her, she's going to be able to handle that. She's She's got the knowledge and the skills. I, I can uh, worry a little less. Um, I wanted to, to ask you when things go off kilter, because mm -hmm. um, they do, yes, uh, what, uh, is there any kind of pattern you've noticed? Uh, that's one of your your superpowers is, is pattern recognition. Is there something you can see early that things might start to go off kilter or you can try and circumvent that? Or what are the common causes of off kilterness that you've noticed? I mean, there, there are many. Um, but circling back to one of the other things that I think about when I'm in the development process with an editor for a project or with a uh, client that we're thinking about putting on submission, um, Many of the most unhappy situations I have seen play out in the publishing process, if you boil them down to what was the core of what went wrong, it was usually a mismatch of expectations. Uh, and that can happen at any point in the process for any number of reasons. But at the beginning of the process, it has to do with, well, what is the book itself? And so, you know, I, I spend time with my clients working with them to figure out what is the heart of the story that matters to me? What is the thing that if someone told me that can't be a part of your story, that you, you wouldn't even want to write it anymore? You know, like it's that essential to you. And, and um, I'll give an example of this that I think illustrates it really well, because it's a pretty abstract idea. Uh, 
but we do the work of identifying, honing in on, okay, what is this story about? What, what about you makes you want to put this story into the world? And some, some of the work we do is to tease that up to the surface a little bit more. Um, because I want an editor who acquires a book to see that same thing in it and hopefully be drawn to that same thing. And if they're not, sometimes you have a very unhappy situation that only gets un more unhappy. So if the author thinks, I wrote a romance, and the editor thinks, I bought a thriller, nothing <laughs> about that process is going to be happy. The editorial notes are gonna feel off kilter. Um, chances are the author isn't gonna feel like the cover communicates what they were hoping for. The marketing language may feel weird and like it's emphasizing the wrong thing. And it's just a mismatch of what each of these two parties thought the book was. So I think it's a really important thing, um, if we can, to figure out what is the thing. Uh, and an example of this from when I was an editor myself, um, one of the first books I ever signed up, or actually the first book I ever signed up as an editor was called A Dog's Way Home by Bobby Pyron. It's a beautiful middle grade, um, I, I describe it as a girl dog love story in that it's a girl and her beloved Sheltie, they get separated by accident at opposite ends of the Blue Ridge Mountains and they're trying to get back home to each other. And the story alternates first person girl, third person dog, chapter by chapter. And so you're getting the first person girl's point of view which is this emotional journey and everything she's going through, having essentially lost her best friend and having to navigate the world without um, that animal. Um, and the dog's version of this is the much more physical, external, like run in with a bear, run in with a porcupine. Like what if he can never actually get home to his girl? Um, and the author, as you might imagine, is very much a dog person, knows animals very, very well, very deeply. and um, you know, sometimes I joke, she's one of those people who probably loves dogs a little more than people, but because of that, she could channel dogs so beautifully. And when she was on submission with this, she had a number of editors who were interested in it. So she had the opportunity to talk with each of them. And it was at the moment when Marley and me was really big. If you remember that moment in sort of publishing pop culture time and the, one of the editors that she spoke to um, suggested that she make it a golden retriever because golden retrievers were really hot at the time. And she said, you know, what if you change this part of it, which to her felt like a really inconsequential detail, but to Bobby Pyron, who knows dogs very deeply, very well, um, she understood that to change the dog would be to essentially kill the whole story because she said, you know, a golden retriever would go home with the first person who offered him dinner and forget he ever had a girl, much less was trying to, <laughs> you know, get home to her, like, forget it. Like he now lives on this old lady's, you know, in front of her fire, like story over the end. So to her, <laughs> the dog being a Sheltie was actually an intrinsic essential part of the story. And to change that would have destroyed it to her. Um, I am lucky in that that was not my recommendation. And so I got to be the one who edited the book. Um, but I've, I've hung on to that story um, because I think it's a really good illustration of, you know, there was nothing wrong with that editor making that suggestion. She was tapping into something that was working and she was trying, or she, he, I don't know. Um, they were trying to pattern match themselves. This is a story about a dog. A certain kind of story about dogs is really popular right now let's lean into that thing that's working. So it, it came from a very smart place, but for the author, it was the very wrong thing. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm thinking about as well. So your question was, how do things go off kilter? What does that look like? A lot of the times it's a mismatch of expectations and that's what it looks like at the beginning of the process. It can look like a mismatch of expectations later in the process too, when you know the author thought, you know, I should be able to retire off of this, and in fact, the book, you know, wasn't that kind of book, or um, you know, they expected 
everyone to love it and were startled when there were negative reviews or you know any number of things but expectations going wrong is is a big part of it or expectations not articulated um you know sometimes an author is afraid to speak up about what they're thinking or what they're feeling and if if they won't identify the question or the problem to either their agent to let their agent go have that conversation on their behalf or directly to their editor or art director, whoever they're working with, um, then it can't be solved and it just festers. You know, it's like a disagreement with anyone else. Sometimes something starts small and if you aren't attentive to it and if you don't try to address it, you just start seeing it crop up everywhere and it, it starts to be a, a discontent when it might have actually been something that could be solved, you know, with a couple of conversations. So just getting out there ahead of that before it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it does strike me as, as odd because, okay, yeah, no, trying to, to match the trend of Marley and me, I, I can understand why that makes sense. But that's such a fundamental change of one of the two key characters. Uh, but one of my favorite uh, examples is um, uh, someone I know uh, here locally uh, wrote a uh, young adult Christian romance at the time that Fifty Shades of Grey blew up. Uh, and her husband's a minister and her plan to market the book was they, they already had an entire network of churches she could go and speak at with mm -hmm. the youth groups and, and, and promote the book that way. Uh, and the editor gets the brilliant idea, why don't we add some BDSM sex scenes to this <laughs> young adult Christian romance? And it, it's just so off the wall. Is that just is that common or are these just the apocryphal tales of a, of a few off the wall editors? See, I mean, those examples sound extreme when you know what the thing that the author wanted was. But when you're the editor looking at the market and understanding what's working and trying to make more successful books in that same space, um, it might not be as, as absurd as it sounds, you know, um, I think we see this sometimes in movies too, right? Like the um, filmmakers, whether it's for storytelling purposes or budget saving purposes or whatever, they do away with something that to them feels like an inconsequential detail without knowing that that was one of the most cherished fan scenes or, you know, both most beloved character traits. Like you, you know, so I think it's, um, understanding again like what's what's the heart of this thing and when when i have conversations with editors when we're in the sort of acquisitions process you know often as a part of that the author gets on a phone call with an editor partly to see are they speaking the same language um you know is the editor identifying some of the things in the story that D did they hear the editor reacting to some of the things that they love best about the story or that they um, value the most? You know, because it can be really easy to be like, oh, this person's saying they love this thing. You know, it kind of goes back to that conversation of this is a business um, conversation. And even though it's good to get lots of personal affirmation, it can be a distraction because question when it comes to publishing a book is not just does this person love it but do they see it in the same way that I do and do they have an idea of of where they're going to take it so that's one of the things to be listening for when you're having a conversation with an editor when you're having a conversation with an agent you know I would think even if you were self-publishing I don't have experience in that realm myself really but even if you were interviewing a cover designer or a freelance editor or something to, to be your partners in that process, you want to know that that the people you're working with are, are seeing through the same lens or the same viewpoint. And if not, it's just going to be confusion. That's um, something I'm 
I know I've worried about, and every, when I when I talk with authors about um, uh, considering self-publishing versus traditional publishing, one of the big arguments for self-publishing is the author is in control, and it and sometimes it feels like you you know you find a literary agent that's going to be your advocate that sees your vision that obviously has a, a wide breadth of experience, and that's why I love these conversations because sometimes people say, "Oh, publishing in the same way conspiracy theorists say the <laughs> government." Now, do you do you yeah. mean the whole government? Do you mean the people at the post office? Who, who, who do you mean specifically? Um, and so how much control can authors expect to give up uh, by going traditional because they're not putting up the money? This is a product now that has been purchased to be distributed by this uh, this larger entity. So how much control are they, can they realistically expect to have? How close can they expect their uh, final product to, to match their vision? And how much input can they have even on the cover? Well, so I'm going to back it up a little bit and say that I think seeing it as giving up or taking control is maybe not quite the right thought process. I think when you decide to work with a traditional publisher, if you have that opportunity, um, you could describe it as giving up control. Certainly, that's one way to see it. I think another way to see it is you're, you're letting more voices into the room. And those voices are going to bring a set of experience and knowledge in the case of publishing, usually very publishing specific knowledge to those things. And you know, using the example previously, had the author not had that particular attachment to Shelties and known that it was an intrinsic part of the story, the suggestion to change it to something that would play better to the market might have actually been a very wise one. Might have, you know, moved the book into the center of conversation. You know, might have gotten it written up in newspaper or magazine or website roundups about, you know, liked this book. You know, here's another one like it. So, um, I think it's it's not that you're giving up control. It's are you willing to let other people have a voice in the process, and are you willing to let other people bring expertise that you don't have because you have the expertise about your story, um, but you don't have expertise in the same way about what's historically worked over the course of the past 10 years, um, where we see the market going, you know, all those kind of things. So it's it's kind of a question of do you do you value having other um, voices in the room or in the conversation and working in partnership with people? Or do you want to be boss of the whole thing? I think there are authors for whom self-publishing is absolutely the right choice. I think the risk of it, though, is if you only ever hear your voice and your opinion or that of you know the people who've lived with it, in the same way that you can't always see in a manuscript what needs to evolve because you've lived with it for too long and you're too close to it, I think the same thing can hold true of the entire publishing process, you know, in the same way of like, are you thinking about all of these questions of audience or are you only thinking about what you've put into it as a creator? That makes sense. That's, um, let's uh, uh, change topics just uh, briefly. Yeah. One, I, I invoke conspiracy theories, so long-time <laughs> listeners of the show know I have to ask you. <laughs> Uh, Molly O'Neill, have you ever seen a flying saucer and do you believe in them? I have never seen a flying saucer. Um, do I believe in them? I believe in the possibility of them. Um, I don't know if that entirely answers it. Um, I don't know if I believe in the version that we have put into movies and media, but I believe in the possibility of um, things larger than our own imaginations and larger than our own existence. Fair enough. Uh, one more uh, oddball question, because I saw this on Twitter and I can't not ask you about this. Um, you described yourself as an uncredited co-biographer <laughs> of Robert Pattinson, eternally <laughs> yours. Um, so one, how does that come about? And two, how do you feel about Mr. Pattinson taking on the mantle of Batman? <laughs> I laughed when I, when I saw this on your list of questions. So this came up a couple of weeks ago. When everyone started buzzing about Robert Pattinson, who, you know, had not been in the news cycle for a minute. Um, but if you travel all the way back to 
Oh, when would that have been? 2007, maybe? 2007, between 2006 and 2008? When he was preparing to take on the role of um, Edward in the Twilight movies. And so I am, in fact, um, I'm not uncredited in, in particular. I brought this to show you. Um, oh, this beautiful. is Robert Pattinson. Oh, let's see. Robert Pattinson, eternally yours, um, by Isabel Adams. And I am half of Isabel Adams, as the other half is my friend and colleague, editor Martha Mihalik. Um, and this is um, it's the kind of book that you spend your like six dollars of allowance on at the Scholastic Book Fair, even though your mom probably wanted you to get something more substantial. And then you and your friends like pour over the photo insert all through lunch, and you like learn all the facts. And and basically, um, it, it came about because my boss at the time, Brenda Owen. Um, realized that there was an opportunity and that to a certain degree, it didn't matter who um, was going to play that role, that they were going to be a huge superstar. And she basically said, let's beat everyone else to getting a book out there about him. So from the moment he was announced, we had nine days to research <laughs> and write this book, um, which led to a fair amount of fluff content. It was also a very different moment of the internet. So there was not there simply was not as much stuff on the internet as we know now. Um, and so um, there were very limited, and he, and he hadn't been, he'd only played one or two very small roles prior to that. So there just wasn't a lot of information out there about him. So, you know, our research involved things like transcribing Spanish teeny bopper magazines that had done interviews with him, like when he was Cedric Diggory and Harry Potter, we called the, uh, theater that he had grown up, the community theater he'd grown up in acting in in London and had an interview with a woman who had worked there at the time, what she remembered about him. We um, bought the photos that she had in their archive and they were some of the wonderful photos uh, in this insert. Um, and we put this book together. Uh, Is that nine the, days? Nine days, yeah. Um, we basically drank a lot of coffee and a lot of wine uh, back and forth, back and forth, and discovered that deep inside all of us, there is in fact a Tiger Beat reporter um, <laughs> that can, can emerge. And, you know, we decided to put it under a pseudonym because we weren't sure that we wanted to get the Google alerts forever. Um, but we actually thank ourselves in uh, on the title page. Um, in tiny little print, uh, it says the author uh, would like to thank Martha Mihalik and Molly O'Neill for their valuable <laughs> contributions to this project. <laughs> and it's become one of these things. I mean, frankly, we had a lot of fun with it, even though it was this crazy, intense schedule. Um, and, you know, it was so quick that you it couldn't even necessarily have hired an author to do this project. You know, there, there's almost no way, like, you'd have gotten through the contract process before the thing needed to be done. And so my boss said, you know, you're a good writer, find another editor who's a good writer who you trust, like, do this thing, paid us a little bit of money. Um, and in fact, you know, um, I bought a really great pair of boots with that money. And for years, anytime anyone complimented me on them, I said, thanks, Robert Pattinson bought them for me, which was not untrue. <laughs> 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 and so every time he pops into the news cycle, we enjoy telling people, because it's one of the things we kind of forget about, you know, it was like, 10 plus years ago. Um, but it is a fun little party trick to point out that we were in fact at one time the foremost uh, unauthorized biographers of Robert Pattinson. And now that he is going to be Batman and forever part of our shared uh, can canon, uh, are you are you excited and ready to show the boots and the book off some more? Yes, yes. Uh, any, any chance to talk about, uh, he, he's eternally ours as we joke, the book is called Robert Pattinson <laughs> Eternally Yours. So anytime he hits the news cycle, Martha and I will message each other and say, eternally ours. <laughs> and for uh, big time esteemed audience uh, members, big, big fans of the show, you know I'm obviously a Batman maniac. I, I talk about him all the time. Um, I have not seen Twilight. I read the book okay. uh, and I felt like, just the first one, and I felt like I had done my time uh, so I didn't need to watch the movie. I had a uh, one of my friend's wife uh, who was really into the books uh, explain to me all the sequels, and I felt that was a better version than if I actually sat down and read them. I was hearing her excitedly explain to me that, wait, there's a werewolf, and then there's a baby. What? Okay, fine. Um, so I haven't had that experience to, 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 to uh, 
soil me one way or the other. I saw a picture of Robert Pattinson in a tuxedo. Looks like Bruce Wayne. I'm on board. Bring on more Batman movies. I, I mean, it more sounds excited. like you might be someone who would need to read Robert Pattinson. He's I do. Yours. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you I can should. I should read it and make it the uh, <laughs> book of the week at the blog. Bring it back. <laughs> oh, oh my. Um, you will be, a, uh, would you like me to do a short reading? Sure. I, I will do a short reading. Um, so at a certain point, we had completely run out of things to say because this was like a 180 something page book. And uh, and there also, there was not a lot of information in the world about Robert Pattinson, but there was even less information um, out in the world about his love life. And you can't leave out what his love life is like in a book oh, like God, this. No. Like that's that's kind of the that's whole all point. all I want to know about, please go on. Right. So. Um, so we, so I'm trying to find this. I promise it'll be worth the wait. Oh, this is very exciting. A live reading from Robert Pattinson, the yeah. title yours by the author. <laughs> so you never from, know what you're going to get with this show. <laughs> what a, what a wonderful treat. Right. That's right. Um, so the opening to chapter 10, Rob the Heartthrob. Heartthrob. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Hunkola. Haughty. Heart meltingly handsome. Sizzling. Smoking. Juicy man candy, sugar lips, stud muffin, hot swoon. That was our opening to the chapter. As you can say, it's <laughs> tell it's like you have, you've stolen my breath and nothing. deeply moved me with that passage. <laughs> so the great story about that passage was uh, we went on Facebook and asked all of our friends, what are some synonyms for the word hottie? And then we took them all and made the list. And that was the opening, which is all to say crowdsourcing your research is an entirely valid part of uh, the research process for bookmakers of any sort. <laughs> I don't know how, how much of a hottie he is, but I can't tell. He's got a strong jaw, nice pair of lips, going to look great in a cow. It'll be fine. <laughs> all right. All right. We got to we gotta move it away from... Uh, from Robert Pattinson, because <laughs> right now, uh, folks that are that are that are chomping at the bit, they they've heard everything up to this moment. That my God, I've got to I've got to send Molly O'Neill a query. Yeah. I've got to ask you the essential questions. What kind of books are you looking for, and what's the best way that authors should be reaching out to you? Sure. So there are two websites that you can look at. You can look at mollyoneillbooks.com. That's O'Neill with two L's. Um, you can look at rootliterary.com, which gives the broader spectrum of the whole agency that I'm a part of. Um, I have a broad list. My colleagues, Holly and Taylor, do more in the adult space than I do. They do a fair amount of women's fiction and romance and have had wild success with that. So if that's what you're writing, you should query them. I'm probably not your girl. Um, my list starts at YA with a few exceptions uh, and goes down. So I publish young adult books. Should I show some examples? Is that Absolutely. something you'd like to see? All right. So you already saw um, Darius the Great is Not Okay by Adib Karam. Words We Don't Say is another contemporary YA um, about a teenage boy um, who has a um, a lot to say, but is, is holding back on saying it. Um, it's a um, stylistically a very interesting book. It's one of those books that if you talk about too much, you give it away. But um, if you're looking for an interesting contemporary YA, that's a good one. Um, I also do middle grade. Um, this is The Tragical Tale of Birdie Bloom by Temri Belts. This is a uh, fairy tale-ish fantasy or a fantasy-ish fairy tale, depending on how you look at it, about a um, orphan and a wicked witch who start writing letters to each other and end up saving the kingdom. This is Song for a Whale um, by Lynn Kelly. This is the story about a deaf girl named Iris who learns that there is a whale, um, and this is based on a real life whale um, that does not communicate at the same, at the proper uh, Hertz level, which is like the, the measurement to, to be a whale. Um, so this whale is always swimming alone. She learns about this whale and feels like this whale and she have a deep connection to each other and she wants to help the whale find uh, connection. And it's the story of her help this whale, but along the way, what she's really learning to do in looking out for what 
his needs are is she's learning how to advocate for herself and her own needs for the first time. The author is a sign language interpreter. So she um, is writing this based on her 30 plus years being a part of that community. Um, I also do picture books. Um, Um, so Spencer and Vincent, the Jellyfish Brothers, about two Jellyfish Brothers that get separated. This is Emily Dove is my illustrator, not the, uh, this is also her book, Hello Honeybees, which is a Ford book that when you open it up, it's hive shaped, it's kind of a nifty trick. Um, and actually there's also little bees that um, are attached to it that you can use as book markers. I am terrified of bees. That, that book would be like Stephen <laughs> so King. So that one was me. not for you, okay. Um, this is Nerdy Babies. This is a series that just came out in both board book and hardcover, Nerdy Babies Ocean and Nerdy Babies Space. And they are early um, books about curiosity and engaging with the world. This is the Dictionary of Difficult Words by a client of mine who's a lexicographer for dictionary.com. Uh, again, this is just my author, not my illustrator, um, but it is a book um, for the kind of kid who wants to sit around and learn a bunch of really challenging words and then go use them in sentences to like impress their family or scare their teachers. Um, so for a certain sort of nerdy kid or adult, <laughs> it's a great coffee table book too. Um, it's a really good one. Uh, and then I have, let's see, a number of um, uh, a number of graphic novels, which has been sort of an extension of my illustrator list. Um, and so, of course, there are lots I can't show you because they're in the process. But this is Kiss Number Eight, who the author is not mine, but the illustrator is. This is a graphic novel. Um, set in the early 2000s about a character who's learning about the secrets of her family, some questions about her own sexuality. Um, and it's it's beautiful on, on so many levels. Um, Escape This Book Titanic is for, if you have a kid who's um, an artist type, who's all, always doodling, this is basically the story of the Titanic with lots of activity stuff in. So it's like, draw this part of the story, finish that part of the story. It's, um, in fact, it's it's by Bill Doyle, illustrated by Sarah Sachs and you. Um, and so um, these are for a reader who loves like the I Survived series, who, you know, finds sort of like um, complicated minutes in history really interesting, but who also wants to be a little bit more engaged with the story in a sort of choose your own adventure meets a doodle book kind of way. Um, I also represent a number of educators who are also authors. Um, this is Colby Sharp, who some of you guys might know, um, and he did an anthology that is 45, um, authors and illustrators who embarked together on the creativity project in which they each wrote creative prompts and then switched and everybody got someone else's and they had to respond to it and the responses make up the book and then uh, they each wrote an additional prompt which again is for the reader themselves. Um, oh, fun. Yeah. And practical and, for anybody that's looking to teach a creative writing class for yes. younger readers. Yes, it would be great for like creative writing workshops. And in fact, because Colby's a teacher, one of the things he said is anthologies are often way too long to really be used well in a classroom. I want to have an anthology, but to have the pieces be really short, which was a piece of knowledge that, you know, someone who is very well intentioned, but doesn't know that audience um, may not actually understand. So he, he did something sort of unique there. Um, and then I occasionally represent adult books. This is uh, a book that he and another educator, Donalyn Miller, wrote um, for uh, professional educators and librarians about um, the importance of book access. Um, but so boiling that all down, what does my look list look like? Um, young adult authors, certainly. Um, I'm drawn to things that are literary, that you know um, have beautiful, thoughtful writing. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not also interested in smash successes and commercial things. Holly and Taylor are both really, really good at high fantasy, 
they're probably the right person for that kind of project. That's not me usually. Um, I never say never because you know I love it nothing more than when a project surprises me and makes me eat all my words. But most of the time the high fantasy is gonna be the better fit just like the women's fiction and romance is gonna be the better fit for one of them. Um, but for me, um, middle grade, uh, especially middle grade that has again that literary sensibility um, or that is doing interesting, playing with structure, playing with interesting ideas. Um, I'm, I'm really wide open in terms of middle grade. Um, I don't do a ton of nonfiction, but again, never say never. Um, I would be happy to do it if, if the right thing came along. Illustrators I work with, um, and maybe we should talk separately a little bit. Well, they have about illustrators, we barely oh, touched. Um, <laughs> oh, there we are. Okay. Um, I was saying maybe we should touch for a minute on illustrators when I finish this. Um, but I do have a list of illustrators who work on anything from picture books to graphic novels to um, book covers and interior art. Uh, some of them do all of those. Some of them specialize in a particular age range. Um, and then out of that, um, I, I have increasingly a number of graphic novelists or graphic novel illustrators because that's a booming and really exciting part of the market right now. I don't often sign people for picture book texts only. I have a few clients who write picture book texts. Um, usually they are someone who has an established audience or platform. For example, I represent John Shue's picture book um, texts. He has a big audience of book lovers and educators and librarians. Um, and sometimes, you know, if I have a client who's writing other kinds of books and occasionally writes a picture book, then certainly I will work with them on that. But I'm not looking necessarily for someone who, um, you know, is going to write 20 picture book manuscripts over the course of a year because that um, starts uh, I, I think it's not the thing that I'm best at doing. Um, and in terms of illustrators, I don't know, is there a particular question you want to ask me about illustrators? Uh, just how do you go about choosing, an, how, if an illustrator wants to reach out to you, what's going to be your process for evaluating them? And also what's going to be your process for evaluating an author? How are they similar and different? Yeah, so the process of getting illustrators work is actually very different than the process of getting authors work. Although, you know, once there's a contract in place and a book being made, it starts to look the same. Um, but for, as an agent, um, I'm having to find work for my illustrators, which is a little bit different than with authors. Most of the time authors are doing the work and then saying, sell this. Um, for illustrators, I'm doing a lot more of the hustle. Um, which is part of the reason that I have a significant portion of my list as illustrators, because I want editors and art directors to be thinking of me when they're looking for an illustrator for a project. They're going to come. They're going to look at the gallery I have on my website. They're going to see who's new. Um, so it's it's a lot more of me like out there hustling, reminding people like I have all these talented people looking for projects. Don't you want to hire them? It's a lot of me sitting down you know, at lunches or in meetings with art directors with my iPad and we go through portfolios and, and are really looking to see. And it's something that I didn't, I had a, a sense of it again from having been on the other side of the table, but I think um, it's hard as an agent, it's certainly not impossible, nothing is, um, but I think it's harder for an agent if they don't have a number of illustrators because otherwise you're doing all of that sort of hustle just for one client. And it, you know, sometimes, um, and and, art director will come and they think they were interested in one person, but then someone else's style catches their eye for something else and you kind of never know what's gonna happen. So I like that I have a wide spectrum of illustrators. When I'm looking at illustrators, when their stuff is coming into my inbox, it generally comes one of two ways. Either they're sending me samples and a link to their online portfolio, which lets me see the full spectrum of their work. Um, or they're sending me a book dummy um, that they have written and illustrated that's you know on its way to to hopefully being published much in the way that um, an author would send manuscript pages. Um, I do a fair amount of proactive looking for my own illustrators, not just seeing what comes into my inbox. Um, and but either way, whether they find me or I find them, the thing that really catches my eye is a piece of art that isn't just beautiful to look at and that isn't static, 
but that has an energy to it and a narrative sensibility. And when I look at the piece of art, I'm wondering about the story that's happening in it. And I can I can feel the sense of movement happening um, because when you're when you're making a picture book, um, the way the way you use a page is really important. You know, the way the story moves across a page. Is it going to be little spot illustrations like that? Is it going to be a larger image? Is it going to be a full page spread? You know, um, and sometimes, especially in today's world, Instagram has been great for illustrators. It lets them get their work visible and a lot of eyeballs on it. But it does mean that you get locked into this little square. And sometimes that square doesn't show the full range of like, how would you use the medium of a book? So in the same way that an author has choices to make about stylistically, how do they tell the story? Are they telling it in straight prose? Are they telling it in poetry? Are they telling it in text messages? Are they telling it, you know, in interstitial passages of all sorts? The illustrator's also making choices about what um, stylistically they're trying to achieve. Um, so when I'm looking, whether it's at a portfolio, like at a conference or online or something that's come into my inbox, I'm paying attention to the story, I'm paying attention to the characters, I'm paying attention to, do I like this? Um, but I'm also thinking about um, how, how it matches the form of a book. And then I'm thinking about what kinds of projects would this pair well with? What kind of texts? Um, ideally, I'm looking for someone who's got a broad reach who maybe starts out doing picture books, but then eventually moves into um, book covers, or maybe they start with book covers and then move into something else. You know, um, the same way an author can tell a lot of different stories, and that's part of what keeps them fresh and creative. An illustrator needs to have sort of wide open space to play with different formats and things. So I'm looking for someone who um, their work could potentially work for a lot of different kinds of book shaped things. And, you know, they're not only appropriate for one medium. Um, graphic novels are a little different. That's such a, a unique space all its own. Um, if you're doing primarily graphic novels and you're good at them, there's probably going to be work for you for the, the near future because that's a growing market. Um, and But even still, I, I have some graphic novelists who aspire to also, also work on picture books. So, uh, And then you asked, you know, how is that different than um, when I get a manuscript submission? I think obviously one is text and one is art, but they're doing something similar in me as an author, um, or sorry, <laughs> as an uh, as an agent, but even more like as a as a story lover. If if a piece of writing, or a piece of art makes me wonder, um, if if it leaves me curious and wanting to turn the page and know more, see more, wanting to request those next pages, wanting to know what's the scene that comes after this one, how's this character going to grow. Basically, if it ignites something in my imagination, that's usually a good sign that they're on to something that's capturing me. I think a lot of writers get the advice, start your story with action. Um, and I, I actually think that's often the wrong advice because it can lead to a scene that's just a bunch of movement, but doesn't have depth to it and, and doesn't actually reveal anything about that particular character. You could swap them out with someone else and the scene wouldn't look any different. Um, so, but but a story that makes me wonder, that engages my curiosity, my sense of storytelling where I don't know, you know, if you tell me like, um, oh, I'm not gonna think of a good example here, but uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna try because I don't want it to fizzle. Um, but when, when a story is, even from a few pages or a few pieces of art, when I can't see where you're taking me yet, but I'm curious to know where we're gonna end up, that's a good sign. If you tell me everything, if you put it all on the page and I can anticipate, I know exactly where this story is gonna go, I know what the ending is gonna be, and I'm only on the page five, that's much less interesting to me than a story that's sort of waking up my sense of wonder and going like, 
how are they going to get out of this puzzle or where are they going to go from here or like you know what is what is this saying about a larger question and i know you request 10 pages of the manuscript with your with your query um so do you skip the query and just go straight to the pages so that you can have that experience without spoilers so everyone reads queries and pages a little bit differently for me um i very quickly skim the query letter and mostly I'm looking to see if this is someone I've met or engaged with online before or if they've submitted to me previously. I'm looking to see if they're previously published because that of course experience plays into what they're looking for from an agent now um, if they were previously agented. So I'm looking for like the, the snapshot facts but I'm, I'm not paying a lot of attention to their description um, because I always tell people I can't sell a query letter. I, I can only sell your manuscript. So if I, I read the pages and the pages engage me, then I go back and read your query letter in much more um, detail. And, I, and I'm looking then to see how you're talking about the story that you're telling. Um, you know, if you're already signaling to me some of what's important to you about it, some of what your creative process with it has been, who you are, if you have a publishing history, all of those things. Um, if the pages don't engage me, all of that other stuff matters a lot less. Um, and I like a synopsis. My colleagues, Holly and Taylor, have no interest in synopsis. I like a synopsis because for me, it's a little bit of a map. I use it as a gut check to see, is this story gonna go where I think it might go from these 10 pages, or is it, you know, I haven't gotten there yet, but chapter three, it's gonna turn into a completely different kind of story. Um, so for me, it just helps me gauge if the interest that's been sparked is potentially going to continue. Um, I can't always tell that from a synopsis, but you know, I like to have a map when I drive. Some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And authors, I know, I hate synopsis. I hate I writing them. I will. I, I'm forever looking for somebody that can write my synopsis for me. I will pay you cash money. Just please do it. Um, what are what separates a good synopsis from a bad synopsis? What information can you give to poor uh, frustrated authors out there who have no idea how to tell their two two or three hundred page book uh, in a page or two synopsis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do say it's it's um, something I like. It's not a requirement. It's a preference. Um, that said, there's probably an author out there that someday I'm going to wish they had queried me and they skipped me because they they went to all the agents who didn't ask for a synopsis first and one of them signed it. So <laughs> I'm aware it may work against me at some point. Um, for me, a synopsis, it really is like a map of this is where the story is going. These are the key characters. These are the key plot points and subplots that we're exploring. And I think the most important thing that it's actually telling me in addition to like what's happening in this story is it's telling me about the arc of the story. It's telling me how is the story physically externally going to move from chapter one to the ending? what's gonna happen in between. And it's telling me how the emotional story is going to unfold. So it's telling me how, who is the character starting out as, what is their emotional state, and how are they going to change or grow over the course of the story? Who are they gonna be at the ending and how is that different than who they started out as? So it doesn't need to be um, the catchiest writing you've ever done. I think some people think a synopsis needs to be more like flat copy where it like grabs you and holds, holds you know, your curiosity or like it's like a movie trailer voiceover. Um, I don't actually think that's the purpose of a synopsis. That kind of writing, usually the flat copy is written by your editor because they have a little more distance and they're thinking about all those questions of audience that you might not have your brain totally wrapped around yet. So to me, that sort of summarizing for like flashiness is a different kind of writing. I'm not looking for flash in a synopsis. I'm looking for um, simply telling me what's happening. I'm also not looking for every single story beat. Like I don't need to know, you know, on the third day he woke up and this happened and on you know, the fifth day he went to school, but then he came home at lunch and he decided to change his pants. I don't need every action, um, but I'm looking for 
that that sense of the arc and and what it looks like. And I think a synopsis, I know they're horrible. I mean, I hated writing outlines when I was in school. Um, you know, I was I was the person who like wrote the paper and then went back and wrote the outline after the fact to turn in to be like, here is the outline that I wrote in advance of writing my paper. I, I guess what that means is in, in author terms, I'm a pantser. Um, I do think it can be a useful task though for an author to write one because it does force you to step outside of the story and distill it down and articulate it. And if you, if you are an author whose book has the happy fortune of being published, people are going to continue asking you for the life of that book and beyond, what is your book about? And you need to be able to tell them that. And so a synopsis in some ways is a first step toward distilling your 200 or 300 page or whatever it is, story, 80 page, depending on what kind of book it is, 32 page, down to something much simpler. And you know, to have that quick, snappy, you know, uh, distillation, it's going to be even tighter than that. You know, you're going to end up with like two or three sentences, but the synopsis is the nice sort of practice first round of that. That is a beautiful amount of information that anybody <laughs> suffering the, the pain of a synopsis should should listen to this and and take and heed your advice and, and, and that job will be made easier. Molly, I have so many questions for you. I, I, I could talk <laughs> with you endlessly, uh, but I know we've been chatting for about two hours. For and it's while, a privilege yeah. to get to talk with so many wonderful publishing professionals. And it's, it's something I don't want to abuse. Um, so what I, I'm just going to distill it into this question okay. uh, that I like to, to pose to people and we'll call it a night. Um, but what um, what is the one piece of advice that you wish that every author listening to this would take to heart and put into practice because it's going to make them more successful? Hmm. Hmm. I know the hardest whole question for last. Questions, but I didn't know this was <laughs> the one we were going to end on. Um, so what is the one piece of advice that I wish everyone would um, every author would take to heart that you feel would would make them more successful in their career? You know, I think it's, there are many ways I could answer this question, but I think one of them is having confidence in your writing. That doesn't mean having overconfidence or, you know, being um, like having false bravado, but believing in your work. If you don't believe in your work, it's going to be very hard to make me believe in your work, to make another agent believe in your work, to make an editor, a sales rep, a bookseller, a reader believe in your work. And I do feel like I have a lot of queries that come into my inbox in sort of this quivering state saying, do you think this could maybe kind of sort of one day, hopefully become a story? And I understand that because it comes from that that place of like, this is my creation and, and there's a lot of emotion in it. I also get, um, queries that come into my inbox, um, largely from men, that come with a very different tone, which say, you know, subject line is usually something like the 2022 Caldecott winner, uh, instant New York Times bestseller, <laughs> uh, and you know, proceed from there to, with, you know, as, as high an opinion um, as that sounds. I think there's a place between the two. And I think, um, Showing showing up with a confidence in what you've created um, is is part of the process because there's a lot of things in the publishing process that will make you doubt yourself, um, whether that's rejection, whether once you're published it's bad reviews, or um, people not understanding it or, you know, any number of things. There's a lot of things that can happen to shake your confidence. And so I think doing um, what you can to, I, I guess it goes back a little bit too, to knowing why you're telling this story, what is the heart of it to you? What is the intrinsic thing that, that makes it matter to you and that you hope will also make it matter to young people. Because I think that is one of the things that's incredibly unique about our industry. Um, and I see it e even on, on the adult side of the industry is very different. They're, they're primarily writing for an audience of other adults, they're writing as entertainment. Um, and there's a lot of ego at the center of it. 
Um, I think that writing for children and young people and teenagers, there's a different purpose at the heart of it. And we are writing for ourselves, certainly. We're sometimes writing or, or illustrating for the reader we once were. Um, but I think that intention um, demands a responsibility. And it can't be all about you as the creator because the kid who's gonna pick that book up and be changed by it, and that's going to become the book that shaped who they were as a human forevermore, they matter even more than you do as an author. And you have to somehow have calibrated yourself to be okay with that, to have the confidence to say, I believe in this, but I believe in, in my audience even more. So um, I think confidence and intention. What uh, genre can I write where all that matters is, is me? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure I dare to answer that. Um, marketing email copy. How about that? <laughs> there you go. Molly, remind a uh, esteemed audience where they can find you online again. Yes, you can find me at mollyoneillbooks.com. You can find the agency at rootliterary.com. You can also find me um, on Twitter as Molly underscore O'Neill. You can find me on Instagram as Molly O'Neill Books. Perfect. And you can always find me, esteemed audience, at middlegradeninja.com. Head over there, read hundreds of uh, interviews with literary agents, authors, publishing professionals, anybody you'd want to you'd want to see face seven questions. We've got them there. Uh, tune in on Friday when our guest will be author Amber Smith. You know that's going to be a fantastic episode. As always, do not forget to download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. Make sure you request a copy from your library. Uh, and that's it for now. Uh, thank you Molly, for being here. <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. It was what a wonderful conversation. We had a live reading from Robert Pattinson and Eternally <laughs> Yours. My and God, you what a wonderful episode changed. of the podcast. All of this you. is a special one. <laughs> So thank you again for, for making the time. And if you would sign us off, our sign-off phrase, very ninja-like, uh, is hi-ya and what have you. Hi-ya, what have you. <laughs>